Hello, it's a privilege to have uh, with us Team Cricket Unfiltered. Though it's a team of three, we've got two of them, Paul Dennett and Andrew Menzel. And uh, Paul is thankful that he's not around Menas because uh, he can have his sandwich at will and not be uh, uh, countered by Menas on that. Uh, welcome to this chat, uh, guys. Hope you're doing well in COVID times in Sydney. Yes, we are. Thank you for having me. So, so, Men so Menas, uh, I just wanted to check with you. Is Paul allowed to have sandwich while you're shooting the uh, podcast or has that uh, uh, restriction not been lifted at No, I just think it's the wrong attitude to have. I think, you know, you should be eating before or after the podcast and not during. And if Paul pulls out a sandwich during this interview, I might just go because, you know, it will be a bad look for Cricket Unfiltered. Okay, I think Paul's looking for something, but he's driving, so unfortunately, he can't he can't have uh, something on this uh, on this chat. Uh, but guys, uh, uh, I'm not currently driving. I, I have stopped to actually do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so guys, uh, uh, how how far back did you guys start this uh, uh, podcast, Cricket Unfiltered? So I guess uh, I started the Australian Cricket Podcast in 2013, and I started because there were no cricket podcasts for fans and then a few years later i went to news limited and we changed the name to cricket unfiltered and it's been cricket unfiltered since then and around i think 2015 or 2016 paul's first appeared on the show and i was immediately struck trans chandress and this is what i have a sort of a radar for cricket tragics and immediately when I met Paul I knew he was the real deal he was just as obsessed as I was and and uh yeah we, then we collaborated more okay. and Paul, I think one uh, of the was, one of the things that I think we both were impressed with each other was that in 1994 one of the last tours of Australia that wasn't covered on any form of television and wasn't on radio Australia was in Pakistan and men and men as and I we didn't know each other but we each sat up through the night waiting for every half hour for the, uh, for the news updates. And that's how we were watching um, whether Steve Ward would get a century, whether Australia would, would beat Pakistan. So that was, um, we both recognised we're pretty, pretty tragic. And, and I think that was also the tool when the Aussies decided to have a bit of a moustache competition. If you remember, Joe Angel and the rest of the bunch, uh, they, they started growing a moustache on that tour uh, because they had nothing much to do outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always one where um was it uh was it Ian Healy who couldn't grow one very well was always kind of um came last in those and he got I think he he missed the test match one of his only test yeah. matches in that too when Phil Emery came over when he got a broken finger. Yes, absolutely right, absolutely right. Uh, so guys, uh, I just wanted to chat with you. Have you guys been tracking the India England Test series and uh, looking at how that has gone since how India did in Australia? What's been the reaction like in Australia to what happened to India in the first test against Australia against England? Well, I think that um, for, for cricket fans, it's been one of um, interest because uh, it, it's a massive series and we've obviously got the Ashes coming up um, next year. So <laughs> there's kind of um, no good outcomes for Australia because we don't want England to be too good because then they might beat us in the Ashes. But we kind of also, I don't know, there's a, there's a little bit of um, probably happiness that India lost to, to knock them off their pedestal a tiny bit. Um, I suppose for the wider public um once the Australian sort of international summer ends, then cricket probably starts to dip below the radar a little bit. So, uh, but it's probably got more interest than most series not involving Australia, I would say. Dan Chandras, uh, I think mainly the, the, the main interest revolves for the public around whether the Australian team can make the test mm. championship final at Lords. Uh, Australians are fairly insular by nature. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the focus is on can England and India sort of end the series fairly even, which will mean Australia just sneaks in. And, and what do you guys make of uh, this uh, problem of plenty that England seems to have? Uh, they decided to, they obviously will decide to rest uh, James Anderson from the test match and they seem to be playing James Anderson and Stuart Broad in alternate test matches. They don't want to play them in the same eleven. And uh, Josh Butler is going away after the first test match. And uh, Johnny Besto is not here. Uh, does it show that the world has changed in a way? Because uh, Paul Menners, we are all from vintage time. And we, we've known guys to be rested from ODIs and bilateral series and bilateral ODIs. All from tournaments in Sharjah. I remember 
uh, Jeff Marsh led a side in 80s for Australia in Sharjah. And uh, Justin Langer kept wickets in a Sharjah tournament in 94. But uh, we've never known sides to rest key players from test matches. Is this the changing world order in your view? Well, I think there's a few things coming into it. With, with the English team, I think they're trying to sort of set up for the future beyond Broad and Anderson. And they've used this tactics, you know, right throughout the English summer and then on tour of alternating them. And I don't know if you remember, but at the the first test of the English summer broad didn't play and he was filthy with being left out. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of that, you know, planning for the future. And I sort of think as well with the COVID situation and the bubbles, we will see players resting from test matches. Uh, and, and I've kind of got used to it. I know what you're saying. Traditionally you sort of set your best test team um, and then you, you sort of stick with it. But I mean, even the Indian team, you know, they didn't even pick so many of the players that, beat Australia at the Gabba. Uh, so, you know, that goes against everything, you know, that I think you sort of about keeping a winning team. So that that's my thoughts on, on it. And I think, yeah, we do have to get used to it. Although I think that Broad and Anderson, they might end up playing in this uh, second test match because Jofra Archer is going to be unavailable. But I think England are being smart and that they are sort of respecting the primacy of test match cricket by by doing this resting. That um, uh, India kind of had these enforced... Uh, squad rotations in Australia because of all the injuries, maybe Australia would have been better off um, having a little bit more rotation as we did in 2019. And with, with back-to-back test matches and with fast bowlers getting worn out on um, unresponsive wickets, uh, I think there's no choice. But yeah, in an ideal world, you'd always pick your best 11, but you're right, um, the, the world is changing. And the other interesting bit has been the rise in stature of uh, Joe Root. And uh, it, it's interesting to know what you guys think about it because I've been listening to a lot of podcasts from UK and they seem to feel that it is the arrival of Chris Silverwood which has sort of allowed Root to grow in stature. And they felt that uh, Trevor Bayliss was someone who would be in the background and let the let captain run the ship. And that's what Owen Morgan liked and uh, he liked to be in control. But Joe Root is somebody who likes uh, the, the coach to run the training bit and the planning bit and he wants to be able to run the ship on his own uh, steam. Uh, so, do you, do you buy, guys, uh, buy this uh, theory that the experts from UK seem to be propounding right now? Well, before this tour, on the last tour, when England went to Sri Lanka, there was a lot of whispers that maybe Root wasn't suited to being captain and it was affecting his batting too much. Uh, That was my concern because he was such a phenomenal batsman and he just seemed to go off the boil at the same time he got the captaincy. And you only have to look at players like Lara and Tendulkar that are, you know, wonderful batters, but weren't great captains. So I think the concern was the captaincy was affecting his batting. And clearly we've seen that that's uh, out the window now after these series of high scores. And I hope he doesn't bring this form to Australia next year for the Ashes. We'll never bloody get him out. <laughs> I think the Silverwood thing is an interesting one. It's, it's, it's kind of a beguiling theory. It's fun. To, it's not fun. It's, it makes sense to say it. But whether it's true or not, I, I often find in cricket that there are a lot of theories propounded that um, uh, sort of are backfitted to the numbers. And you know, it makes sense that maybe Silverwood taking a more active role has released some pressure off Root and allowed him to express his, himself more with his batting. But um, I'm kind of, I need to see hard scientific evidence. I don't know, I don't know how you get it, but I, at this stage, I just put it as a theory. Menas, you don't need to worry about Root scoring runs in Australia because they haven't won a test in anger in about a decade in Australia. So it's okay. <laughs> we know, we've know. got a clock. We've been, basically, every day that goes by, it's 10 years and counting since England has won a test match in Australia, and we're very, very happy about that. And and what do you think about uh, Joe Root's uh, rival, uh, Virat Kohli? Uh, now, he's somebody that people in Australia love to see quite closely. He seemed to be, you know, from, from, from watchers in India, he seemed to be a little more subdued. It almost seemed like he was a Jinke Rahane uh, uh, like, in the sense that he, uh, he, was, he wasn't as animated as... I've seen him over the years as captain on the field or as a player. Did you get a sense that, you know, the successes of Ajinkya in Australia uh, seem to have tempered him down? Though on the fourth, uh, third, fourth day, he did come back into his original self when Ashwin got uh, Rory Burns on the first delivery. So, did you get a sense that he has tempered himself down or fatherhood has uh, tempered him down? 
I think that also when you're conceding almost 600 in the first innings after a while and uh, in that sort of condition, it's hard to be too animated, I suppose. I think it wouldn't be a bad thing. I think I think Coley's a great captain, but Rahane seemed to bring a bit of a more um, uh, cerebral edge to it. And, you know, the, the passion of, uh, of Coley, if that can be uh, su- uh, supplemented with a little bit more of the, the, the brain power behind it, then he might even become a, an even better captain. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that Coley's both mellowed and matured in the last two or three years. We're really seeing not just a great leader, but he's, he's a very fine statesman for Indian cricket. And, and I think we're just seeing him uh, really develop into one of the you know finest leaders of a cricket team around the world. And do you guys see India making a comeback in the series? Because uh, they seem to pull a rabbit out of the hat each time they were in trouble in Australia after the Adelaide Test match. Can India come back in the series like they did in Australia? Yes, 100%. Definitely. I mean, I think yeah. that um, I think pound for pound, I think India has a slightly better side than England does for Indian conditions, but the gap is not so, so, so big that it can't be bridged by, um, you know, getting the, winning the toss was obviously massive for England and, and a couple of good performances, Joe Root playing really well, that's enough to bridge that gap. But I think if they were, you know, if they could play a, a 25 test series, eventually I think India's dominance would, would still be there. They'd, they'd win it, but not by an enormous margin. I think they are slightly better. And so it just comes down to, um, you know, um, who gets the better of the conditions and which individual players perform better. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the exclusion of Patel, Akstar Patel from the first test really left them short with that sort of fourth and fifth bowler. And I think Sundar and Nadeem, they just weren't able to support Ashwin, Bumrah and Sharma. And I think uh, the whispers are that this, the team will change for the next test. I think the team's already been dropped. So I think you'll see an improvement um, in the Indian performance. Is, uh, is the day back anytime soon? Not anytime soon. soon. Not anytime soon. Not anytime right. soon. So, so that's really yeah. dented the, the lower middle order for, uh, for Virat Kohli. And, you know, Jadeja makes a huge impact in India along with Ashwin because they, they are a deadly combination in India with, uh, and Jadeja strike rate in India is, is amazing. Yeah, Jadeja is close to the best player in the world in Indian conditions. I, I'm surprised that he's not regarded more highly by Indians. If you just looked at pure numbers, um, he's almost got a better record than any other Indian test player ever. It's just um, absolutely phenomenal. So uh, every time he's not playing against Australia, I, I'm relieved. And, you know, I think the problem also is that in India, we seem to think that only a guy who can both seam up and back is an all-rounder. They forget that the head coach of the team currently, Ravi Shastri, mm-hmm. used to ball left arm spin and back and was regarded an all-rounder. I think somebody somewhere down the line has forgotten to update the systems in India with regard yeah, to I th- that. I think it's fantastic <laughs> when you've got Rishabh Pant and um, Jadeja in the same team. I think that gives you the perfect balance at six and seven. You've got two counter-attacking batters who can sort of use the foundation that players like Pujara have laid. Uh, and then it also gives you that fifth bowling option. You can go in with three quicks and two spinners. And captains love having that good fifth bowler. It just gives them so many more options in the field and, uh, you know, it gives you more options right throughout the game as the conditions change. So, uh, you know, when that, when Jadej is fit and pants in there and they've, they've obviously moved on from Saha for the moment, I think that's a, a really strong Indian team. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to labor a bit. And I think this. that we, uh, Go on, go on, go on. Paul. There you go. Yeah. No, I just wanted to oh, I was just going to say that I... <laughs> go on, go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Go on. I think that India's aggressive mindsets and the players like Hunt, uh, and you know the whole style, uh, with the exception of Pajara, tends to. To get off. We've lost you, Paul. No, we lost, we've lost you, Paul. I think you're God. He's uh, making less sense than normal, Jan uh, 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 So 
I just wanted to, uh, Andrew, just wanted to uh, think that was a the decisive on. factor in Australia. Put a high price, obviously, you have to put a high price on your wicket. But this, I think India has shown that um, that's not have that attacking power in Test cricket. And people talk about, uh, have you got me now? Am I back? Yeah, just your voice, not your. Uh, oh, yeah, now we've got you. Yeah. What were you going to say, Chandras? Chandras. No, I just wanted to labor a bit. Uh, you spoke about the aggressive, but uh, I just want to labor a bit on the punt factor. Now, India has been a bit of a bind with regards to punt. Uh, they want punt the batsman in the 11, but they can't play him as a pure batsman, which means that you're dropping one of Rohit, Gil, Pujara, Virat, and Ajinkya. Uh, and so, how, how much longer should, say, India be patient with punts keeping? Because uh, this is a question that that keeps coming up time and again in Indian, uh, Indian uh, cricket conversation. I guess if I was the captain and they the should. coach, I'd be looking at how hard Pant's working on his keeping behind the scenes. And if you're seeing improvement, and I'd stick with him. If he's if he doesn't have that in him to work hard, because look, being a Test wicket keeper, it's bloody hard work and. Um, if he's not prepared to put in the training and that's why Adam Gilchrist retired suddenly because he dropped a catch and he thought, you know what, I can't be bothered with all the training anymore. Uh, so I, I think that's a, a question for the, the coach and the, the captain. But what we did see with Gilchrist, that if you have a keeper who's batting at six or seven and can play those counter attacking innings, it can turn your side from a, a good side to a, a really, really good side. And Joe Root gave a perfect Joe Root gave the perfect uh, uh, reply. He said that he was planning for Rishabh Pant when he did delayed declaration uh, in the second inning. That's a big tribute to Rishabh Pant's mm. impact on India's uh, test batting. Uh, I thought he was um, forever. I, I would never consider dropping him. And I agree with Menas. He needs to keep on working hard and improving. But I sometimes think the difference in keepers is overstated. That some of the mistakes he's made, if, if Saha was behind the stumps, he possibly would have made the same mistake. So um, maybe hire Ian Healy, get him over there and um, work hard with him. But uh, uh, Rishabh Pant's one of the first players I'm picking for India every single time. Uh, hiring uh, Ian Healy is a bit tricky. He might just sign him up for a domestic T20 competition back in Queensland. We don't want that. <laughs> uh, get him just, out of the country <laughs> just one last question to you guys uh, uh, looking at the way England's doing over the last few months in test cricket uh, and the fact that Australia will not have any test cricket till probably the end of the year uh, do you think that this English team can do what Andrew Strauss' team did in 2010 and rescue Ashes back from Australia in Australia you go first, Paul. The screen seems to have frozen. Okay, I'll jump in then. Chandresh, I'm actually quite nervous about this upcoming series in, in, in next summer. I think England have a pretty complete side, and I think they could cause some problems for this Australian team, more so than definitely the last two, two three tours where they've been smashed. So I'm actually nervous about it. I think it could be a, a quite a close series. And, uh, yeah, I think they could definitely cause trouble. Uh, on that note, thanks a lot, Manners. We seem to have lost uh, Paul there with his connection. But uh, thanks a lot for uh, giving time to uh, Cricket Chronicles with Chandresh. Uh, it's a fledgling channel. And uh, thanks a lot for all the support. And uh, I'll keep listening to you guys uh, constantly on uh, your podcast. I think that they'll, be dogs. they'll be underdogs. Um, but it's a plus. I think Paul's dipping in and out but uh i guess uh, uh i think the connection is pretty unstable so we seem to have there lost he goes. It. yes he's gone uh so thanks a lot uh Menard and paul for giving time to uh, cricket chronicles with Chandrish. really appreciate it and i i'm i am an avid listener to cricket unfiltered and thank uh, you i quite like the banter between the three of you thanks a lot uh, for joining me well thank you very much for having me it was a real pleasure great thanks a lot guys Thank you.